in your life. Are we live? Is it, are we framed up good? Make sure we're framed up. Oh, we are framed up. We're all framed up? Framed up, dude. All right, sweet. We are live. Okay. Good morning. Training Tuesday once again. Back with Sam Nix, CrossFit Dallas Central. Uh, last Facebook live session with Sam was a pretty big hit. And a lot of people asked if we could do it again and try and get a little bit more specific. So we're gonna do that. This was a little bit last minute how we put this together, but I think it's gonna work out because quite honestly, I could just sit here for an hour as you probably could listen to this dude talk. So and last time- we can talk for a really long time for an we hour. Can, we can talk for a long yeah, time for real. Uh, last time we talked a little bit about just training in general, kind of how training applies to my program and then Kind of went a little bit more in depth on some things in regards to like maybe what sort of load and what you could expect from that and different things. So now today we want to talk about a word that is fairly basic in the strength training community but very, very important. And that word is what, Sam? Periodization. And what does that mean? That's a great question. So I think, um, I think what starts the conversation is... Um, is really like a discussion about uh, planning. So some of the subjects that we touched on last time that we spoke was like, um, oh, that's cool. That's, yeah, that's we can watch. Uh, <laughs> how? What was the live time? Oh, don't look at that. That's okay, so I can right. answer questions. Okay. There's bound to be a ton of questions okay, for okay. you. So. Um, so yeah, the last time we talked about planning and. Um, you know that's that's like the that's the first argument that's always made is is someone good at what they do because there's a, a lot of planning and foresight or is someone good because they just do it a lot and it's guided by intuition um, and you know to to be a good a comparable at a, a skill a sport develop a, a an athletic capacity it does require some kind of planning even if that's based on intuition, I think the only way that you arrive at intuitively saying, I need to do this now or later, you know, I, uh, you know, how many miles is best for me is because at some point um, you experienced it, you have some information, and then it helps you be well informed about what happens in the future. And so that in and of itself is kind of planning. Like it's not random, I guess that's my point. So periodization is this, uh, by the way, if you can't hear us, we'll speak a lot louder. We're, I can talk uh, louder than this, but I think it's I think it's okay. Periodization is a, a an exercise science, a sports science term for planning. Um, it's really research based. So, you know, they uh, like let's say let's take like weightlifting for an example, because there's a lot of data behind weightlifting. They basically saw what coaches were giving athletes for you know decades upon decades, and they looked for trends, and these trends make up um, patterns of you know, certain time of the year, a certain amount of work happens and what happens leading up to the Olympics or a meet or whatever. And they compile that information, they make their best guess and they say, well, it looks like most athletes who are successful do this, we manipulate it. And you know, what comes out of that in the research is a plan. And there's a lot of different types of periodization methods. Um, but really all it is is just, it's a, it's a very formal way to plan things out. So if you've ever been on a periodized plan, like a, a really simple, um, basic endurance plan for running, for instance, is the uh, real old school method, the Arthur Linear method, which is like uh, you do a you know a really hefty base period that's a ton of long slow miles, and then maybe you sharpen that base with some tempo work, and it just gives this like logical progression on. And most most people from endurance sports have done that. You have a base phase, and then you have a phase where the base mileage gets cut out. You have some tempo speed work. Um, and then stuff that you do prior to the competition, and then you taper, and you peak, and then you go to the competition, and then you what happens win. after, and you win, um, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but periodization gets really uh, bastardized because it is it does take out the human element, which is you. And so to look up a plan and say, I'm gonna follow, like, the, so, so first, here's the, some of the you know types of periodization. There's linear periodization. So linear means, um, if I was, let's say, to ride, like I was only riding long and slow, and every week I said I want to add on 30 minutes extra of riding, and, and I'm going to accumulate it that way. So I start my 
the first week of this plan at four hours a week, and then six months later, I'm at 10 hours a week. And that's linear periodization. It's taking one quality and then slowly improving that quality week by week, month by month. Um, that means that the workouts though, every week within that block of training, um, that linear block, they're all the same kind of workouts. Um, a different method of that is called undulating, and that's where um, multiple different types of training for that thing happen in the same week. So you might have uh, a long day, and then a tempo day, and then a speed or a technique day or whatever. Um, there's reverse periodization, uh, there is block periodization, there's a lot of different types of them, but it's all research based. So what, what we uh, really say periodization is, is any time that you plan something out. And I, I like to get away from using those traditional models because um, you know, there's nuggets to take out of them. Like definitely a base period for some athletes is great. Um, definitely for other athletes, it makes sense not to have a base period and every week that we're hitting you know, a diff different type of session per week. What it really boils down to is that human element of um, when we get an athlete, there's almost more conversation about what's your sleep and your work schedule and your home life and you know the availability to. Uh, we were talking about a, a girl who just run. Hey, what was that run? What was that race? The um, that that girl won the 250. The Moab 240. Yeah, it's the Moab 240, and it's a uh, thanks, Brian. And it's a ultra marathon, and this girl, um, a, a female, won over everybody. And she broke the course record by 10 hours, a 240 mile uh, foot race. And so she was on, um, she was on Tim Ferriss and he was asking oh, yeah. her a bunch of questions about her training. And she was like, well, honestly, I just stepped outside of the door and I have, you know, this trail by where I live and I just ran all the time and, you know, ate a lot of food and it was super simple. Like her, her method of the amount of volume she could accrue because she could step outside of her house and immediately train had a different plan attached to it than someone who said, man, I live in the middle of New York City and I have zero access to trails. Um, or I, you know, Dallas has terrible access to trails, like really, really long trails. So that's honestly what we start with for planning. There's this. And on that note, next Tuesday, we're gonna have Dean Zhu back. And Dean's gonna talk about something similar, his training for a just foolishly long, um, I think that was 200 miles. Yeah, it was uh, 250, and I think it was a team of five. Team and it was his first, first uh, race longer than a, I think he did a 50K one time, and that was it. So we prefaced uh, that last week. He'll get on next week, and we'll talk about how his training was structured for that yeah. here, based out of Dallas, yeah. and how that worked. And Brian, who's standing on the other side of the room, was his coach, and uh, all the conversation they had yeah. wasn't about, like, what's the best you know formula for you know all this adaptation stuff. It was... He has four kids, he has a full-time job. How do you get that amount of mileage in and prepare for that kind of race? So a lot of his days were set up that uh, weren't like, Tuesday needs to be this kind of day because exercise, sports science said that that was the best day. It was, that's the only day that you have. And you know, he was doing, he'll mention this, but he was doing stuff like, he, he runs to work a lot and he lives like three miles away. And so he would, you know, every time he had to go home two or three times a day, he would run. And so he'd find a big, you know, long story short. So all, all periodization is, is is a form of planning. And there's this constant argument within certain communities that like periodization is dead. And so they'll say periodization is dead. You shouldn't periodize things. But then in the same breath, they'll say, but here's our plan that we're gonna follow to get you better. And even if that plan is varied to the point of randomness, it's still a plan. And even planning random things is a plan. Yeah. That is a particular type of periodization that people use too in like some of the general fitness phases where it's like, you know, deck of cards for a month, general fitness, whatever you want to make, you know, whatever. So everything gets planned out, whether you call it periodization or not. The, the thing that, that really determines what goes into periodization for you is where you sit in the athlete continuum. So we have, if we had a whiteboard behind us, we would draw this this big X, Y chart, and at the very top of that chart, there would be this, uh, this peak cap line that would say, this is my genetic potential. And on one side is how long I've been training, and on the other side is what I can do with that training. And, the, the, and we all know this just based on experience, but like the, the fitter that you get as time goes along and the closer that you get to your genetic potential for something, the more particular that training has to be. 
So what it leaves a lot of room for is the people in the you know very beginning of that graph that are very novice to sport. Um, it it isn't as necessary that they are like that extremely focused in terms of I need to spend X amount of months doing only this and X amount of months doing only this. Okay. And a good example of that would be um, let's say like base mileage. The better that you are at something, so take an example of someone who has a 20 year, a 20 year long slow base, and they came to you and said, I have been road, cycle, I've been road biking for 20 years, long and slow, and I'm bored, and I wanna get into enduro, or I wanna get into some kind of mountain bike you know, event. Because they're so good, and they have such a huge base of, of aerobic fitness developed, they could take a couple of years off of not doing any aerobic base work, and that, that physical quality is so ingrained in their genetics at that point, in their mitochondria, that they could take off that time. And they could take those two years and go do other things. Okay, so this is exactly what I wanted to hit on. This is a, the perfect segue into this. So, <clears throat> for those people, I think that's what I want to get across to some of these people is that I think we there's a decent amount of people in this arena that have started to implement strength training. You have that 20 year base person that's read enough, looked at enough social media that says, okay, I'm gonna to start to do a little bit of this strength training. But it's a very simple program that quickly turns into the same mundane activities two, maybe three times a week. Right. So that's where I think this is important. That periodization is lacking because they're doing the same thing. And I think what I'd like for you to maybe try to explain is you don't have to put so much into it. If you're that person, you have your, your five, your 10 year base. That's, that's good. So maybe don't do so many of those rides and get a few more days where you're in the gym, but be strategic about those. You don't have to get incredibly complex with your right. program, but at the same time, there has to be some sort of progression within right. that. If you're doing right. the same thing, I'm not gonna say your body's getting used to it. There's, there's still a stimulation on the central nervous system, but at the same time, you're investing your time. You might as well invest it a little bit more strategically and get a little bit more of a return. Right. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And so, um, like with, like, so with that example, so we'll just take two different types of, of athletes to, to use as an anecdote. Anecdote. <clears throat> so we have one that has, you know, I've been doing this in six months. Thanks, uh, sponsor. Specialized. <laughs> but we have, um, so let's say we have one guy who has a 20 year uh, huge high mileage base. So for him to, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say most people know what this means. Like I put a heart rate monitor on or I have a power meter and I'm at a uh, whopping, you know, 130 beats per minute, 100, 150 watts for three hours, four or five times a week. And I've done that for 20 years. That's such a, a high adapted athlete to that one specific, one specific aspect of fitness that it doesn't mean that he's a really good athlete in other things. It means that he's really, really low on the totem pole when it comes to, because when we look at athlete age, we look at athlete age, um, not just in overall athleticism, but athlete age for the, the thing that you're training for. So you're, you know, your athlete age for aerobic fitness might be 20 years old but your athlete age for strength training and technique work and things that you've never done before might be zero. And the, the lower that your athlete age is in something, the more freedom you have to play around with it and the less beneficial it will be to stick to that one thing all of the time. Because the guys who need to stick to it would say, I have this incredible base and uh, like maybe I'm, I'm such a good mountain bike, like I'm so good at enduro that I'm tapped out and I can't, I, I don't know how to get even better. We would have to say, I think we need to find these limiters and only focus on those things for a while. And why can we only focus on those things? Because all these other things that aren't being touched on are so well ingrained with you, they're not gonna go away. They might not get better, but that's not the thing that we need to improve right now. Yeah, so I think what you just described, I'll bring my scenario into the mix. When I started racing mountain bikes in 2013, I'd ridden bikes my entire life, but a lot of it was BMX, dirt jumps, things like that. I never had that long base. So for me, my athlete age, my training age, in that capacity was very low. Right. So what I needed to do was just pound my legs and pound my legs. So I didn't hardly focus at all on riding on the dirt to get better. 
I got on a mountain bike and did stupid oh, six hour rides and climbed 10,000 feet right. just to beat my legs in submission to tell them this is what you need to acclimate to. Right, so when you create a plan, and, and um, so you know, on the, you're, you're almost like on the flip side of that, which is you didn't have a 20 year base of, of aerobic fitness, but you, I mean we talked about this, like one of the reasons why you got into it and it, it became such a good thing for you so quick is because um, if, I mean, t t you, if you can handle a 200 pound dirt bike, you can handle a 10 pound mountain bike, you well, know, in terms of 22, to whatever, but you know, <laughs> so, 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 uh, like the, in terms of what Endure requires. Yeah. yeah. And so that's almost the opposite. So, I mean, it's, it's a, it's like, sounds really simple when you say it, some guy who had 20 years of the long, slow stuff and has zero technique and confidence on the bike and you have every confidence in the world on the bike, but a really poor maybe base for that. I actually, as a side note, I pulled up the very first email that you ever sent us. And <laughs> this is before him and Sarah got married and it was like, hey, uh, you know, I'm interested, this is what I do. And it was a lot of, all. I think all you said was like, I do these basic lifts, I do some kettlebell stuff, I have a TRX, you know, yada yada. And you actually said at the time, and I'm gonna bring my girlfriend here, which was Sarah at the time. <laughs> You hadn't been married yet. Um, and you know, so there wasn't any of that in your program. And if you, if you write a program for somebody, um, the very first thing that you take into account is what's on the other side of the equation, which is race comparability, or what's the goal for the training plan. So you can come up with all this great training, um, but it all first has to deal with what the goal is in the plan. The second thing below, what is the goal? So a goal for someone who says, man, I just love the bike and, and maybe I am gonna enter in some races, but honestly, I just really wanna get better at like handling the bike. And that is a different goal than I want to, I wanna be like a nationally ranked rider. Yeah. So if after that is set, then the second question is, it is who are you? <coughs> who are you? And you is defined as your biological age, which has a lot of implications for training. You know, if you're 18 years old, that's a different training load and recovery demands that it is when you're 40 years old. Um, and then your athlete age, and, and it's your athlete age and all of the different aspects possible to train for that sport. So your athlete age for the technique side of riding a bike was really, really mature. Your athlete age for the muscular endurance, like the lower body concentric muscular endurance piece, the aerobic fitness, it was really low. So that's the first thing that you have to spend your time on. And then when you make these training plans, you basically are, are flushing out, like n name me all of the things that you feel like you might need to be a good enduro rider. You need power, mm -hmm. power is one, because you got to power out of turns. Uh, you got to power off the line, so you definitely need that. You need high motor coordination because there's so many things coming at you so quickly. Um, but on the same note, you need muscular endurance mm -hmm. because the, the aforementioned uh, attributes are going to be done during the stage, which around here is anywhere from 90 seconds to maybe eight minutes at the most. But then you're looking at that in between six hours on the bike, possibly. Right. So you have to have all of those elements right that. so you could say there's a skill component there's you know we call it power but power can be synonymous with um, I mean it is synonymous with strength too because there's a, a requirement for strength if you if you have to make a certain amount of cycles around the pedal at a certain force you have to be able to do it one time before you can do it 1,000 times so you have to have the base strength and power required there's skill component to it and there's a muscular endurance component. And I would even say, if you've never heard this term before, because this is something that doesn't, isn't thrown out a lot, it's making, it's making muscular endurance aerobic. So it's this, um, you know, when we say muscular endurance, you're like, man, my legs are full of blood and I'm gonna have to, you know, I, I could like jam it hard for two minutes, but then I'm gonna have to back off, uh, you know, dump a gear for five minutes because my legs are toast. It's making those contractions endurance. I mean uh, aerobic and to yeah. make those contractions aerobic it means that you have to like there has to be a cutoff point for which <clears throat> how hard I'm going on the bike can't exceed my limit to recover for it so you take all these things into account and you say this is my options for the plan and what are the things that I'm really good at that I can throw you know maybe the backseat to me and what are the things that I need to prioritize and every time that we write a training plan that's, that's what we start with. We look at the limiting factors for someone's 
required fitness and we say these are the most outstanding things that if you improve them will improve your overall fitness. I'm, I'm as, as a side note, there's no substitution for a really good base of general fitness. So to come into something like this uh, and really to train for anything, and I have, I, I've not been a you know, multi-year tenured athlete at it, and we're talking about that guy, is there's no, rep, like, there's no substitution for good general fitness. But you could, you know, like I thought of this the other day, because I was thinking about content for this video, and some people will say, well, what are the easiest things that you can do that will improve your race? So what are some things that you can do without even like messing with your fitness? They can attend a camp that you teach and learn how to ride the bike better. And that might not mean anything in terms of a really difficult or a lot of volume or something complicated. They need to learn how to ride the bike better. They need their bike fitted right. They need the right bike. They need the right gear. They need to learn race strategy. They need to learn what, what, how is my bike geared and what gears are gonna suit me for this particular race. Confidence, more confidence right. simply makes all Which is stuff that has nothing to do with fitness. And most people will put a lot of effort into that. And then they'll say on the, on the fitness, the physical side, now just go ride a bunch. And then there's camps that will be on the other side. Hey, this stuff, yeah, we'll like figure it out, but really, you need to ride a bunch and the technique side and the confidence. And the Which there's still some people that need to ride a bunch. We're well, not saying there's not that's people what the that answer don't. Is. The but. answer is it's both. Yeah. The answer is you have to, you have the, the things that are really easy for you to figure out in the beginning, knock them out of the way. Like go ahead and take those easy steps and attend to your camp and all that stuff. Well, and I think part of it too is the periodization piece, I think is kind of the safety net for not letting the pendulum swing too far one way or the other. Right. If you make a plan and that plan, which is going to be periodized, that'll help keep you in check. And I've, I've fallen into that. Uh, I've, I've made a plan and, and maybe I got a little bit away from the plan because I went more by feel and that feel had me from putting in huge miles to actually being more in the gym. Right. And what I realized was I was more powerful the first half of the day and everything was great. But I was suffering on the second half of the day because my legs were starting to cramp. Right, and that's a form of periodization too. So if you didn't do anything else and you didn't plan anything, you could say, I'm gonna make my best guess. I'm not gonna plan, but you know, maybe my plan is I just wanna I just wanna do it as often as I can. And you go through a race and you have these outcomes to the race that say, Well, the first half of the race, I was incredibly peppy. And the second half of the race, I could barely hang on, and it was everything that I could. Well, that's an implication for a lack of fitness that would be different from, man, I get my second wind on the last 30 minutes of that. And when, it's, when I can see the finish line ahead, like, I'm, that's a different kind of fitness too. And then you could go back to the drawing board and say, well, what makes sense for me that my power feels adequate, but my power endurance feels inadequate. So maybe I need to work on that. And you could come up with programs like that. But what, what people need to start with, and this is like my, kind of one of my first takeaways, is if you could identify first all of those things, so there's a skill component, a strategy, um, you know, some of these intangible tertiary, like non-fitness related components, but that you can still train. So I can get on a bike once a week, and I can practice these things, and I can, I can practice scenarios, I can practice strategy, and that's one session then I know that strength and power is required for that. So, you know, the basic, the, like one of the basic lists for cyclists because it replicates the pedal stroke and it's really easy to do. You can do it with like a, a bucket full of water is a deadlift. So deadlift almost exactly replicates the pedal stroke. Wait a minute, cyclists can't deadlift because it's gonna hurt your lower back. Everybody knows that. Ask Levi Leinfeimer if yeah. you deadlift. And you're gonna get too big and muscular and power to weight. You might, but that's that con that's that contention back to like, hey, you're like Lance Armstrong, a guy like like that caliber of an endurance athlete is so far swung to that side that it's not an issue of if the deadlift will help or not. It's an issue of is this deadlift going to be so far outside of his wheelhouse because he's never done it before, and if I put the deadlift into his program as a 30-year world caliber professionally ranked multi-million dollar sponsored athlete. If I put the deadlift in this program as a coach, I'm gonna say, I don't even wanna take the chance that I'm gonna injure his back. Yeah. That's the only reason that those guys will not do it at that level. And it's not because it's not utilitarian, it doesn't serve a purpose. But if you go back to that, you take these sessions and you say, well, I can have a, a technique, a, a strategy session, 
skill on the bike. I can have a strength and power session. I can have a power endurance session. So maybe that's some interval stuff. Yeah. Like <clears throat> not, not anywhere near threshold. It should be stuff that is difficult, uncomfortable, but sustainable and repeatable. That's one session. And then another session is just getting like the, the pedal stroke economy, the comfort on the bike, like my, like my saddle muscles have to accommodate to being on the bike for that long. Yep. And that's where the mileage comes from. And those are four sessions. Those are four different types of workouts. And we could say maybe that's all that you have. And maybe there's other things too that we can include, like here's some recovery work, here's a, a mobility specific session, but let's stick with those four sessions. Periodization would say, if I'm a really new athlete, it benefits me to have all four of those sessions every single week. So how much of those sessions I need honestly depends on the outcome of the race and it depends on how my training is progressing. But in the beginning, I need to have all four of those because I need to give each one of those a chance to set in in terms of fitness because I'm not anywhere near close to saying I'm so good at this one component that that one component can hang back a little bit or this one component needs to be emphasized more. But the fitter that I get, the longer or the more time that I need to be spending on one of those qualities. So if I, and this is different strokes for different folks, no pun intended, but if I was on that plan two years down the road, it might still look like those four different types of workouts, but instead of one day spent per week, maybe it's like one, one week spent per month on those things. Or <clears throat> some, you know, there's lots of different ways to cut this, but I have, you know, two months where 50% of my training is nothing but the base mileage and the technique. And then I have a month that is nothing but strength and power. And then I have a month that is nothing, in terms of emphasis, not, not only that, but I'm gonna emphasize most of my plan being this or this or this or this. And there are very logical progressions that fits with, with like fitness and improvements in fitness. But it's, it's basically to say, when I pick something to do, I still need to be doing all of them in some form or fashion. How much of that I need to do depends on the person, depends on how close they are to the race, depends on the time of the year, and then it depends on like the lifestyle factors of like, you know, if I, uh, if I, if it takes me every, like it, it's a big deal to get my bike, get in the truck, drive out, load up the gear, yada, yada, yada. Maybe that is the only day that I do that, but where can I spend more time and more effort? Well, it's really easy for me to drive 10 minutes to goals and get in the gym. It's really easy for me to, you know, I'm gonna spend a couple hundred bucks on a used bumper plate set or some kettlebells yeah. on Craigslist and I can do it in my backyard. Maybe that's where the effort needs to be spent and that's okay. It doesn't mean that one's better than the other because what does it really matter is that if you did better in, in the, the, the subsequent race than you did in the previous. Yeah. So, <clears throat> or just or just the ride. Like you brought up time of the year. Now is the perfect time of the year. It's starting to get cold, and I know a lot of people who don't like to ride when it's cold. They've been riding a lot. They've been putting in huge volumes. So now might be that time where maybe November is that month that skews a lot more toward a lot more towards the strength training right. and recovery side right. of things. And I think that is something that you know I'm glad you brought that up because that's often overlooked. Uh, if you've been charging it hard all summer and now we're getting to the point where you know you're dealing with some nagging injuries this can be a multifaceted approach you can address those injuries make a plan to fix those issues right. at the same time build your strength base to hopefully not have those issues come next season right it's circular so Feel the flow it, it, it really is I mean it really is we could sit here all day and, and I mean we could come up with like a hundred different ways to approach it, but I, I'm never going to know what the, is the right way until someone actually, you know, tests it, yeah. and that test can be the race, and, and the test can be, it can not be a race. We have a bunch of people up here at the gym that are like, I want to get fit, and so the first, you know, it's like, well, do I need to do a competition? Like, no, man. Fitness could just be the things that we're doing in the gym and we're measuring them, and at the end of the month we say, today's your big day that we're going to, and it feels like competitive. Today's the big day that we're going to test this stuff. It doesn't have to be an actual event, but the, the, the notion that I have to only do one thing or <clears throat> I'm afraid to step outside of what is my you know, year to year norm, <clears throat> the, the, really the only way to answer that would be is what you're doing observably getting you better and you're doing more from whatever that measurement is, a month to month, a year to year, quarter to quarter, 
Right. It's the only thing that really matters. <clears throat> and that's a tough one for some people. Some people don't want to really take stock of themselves. And is there improvement? Is there, is there not? No, and the best athletes in the world are the ones that are like super unbiased about that kind of stuff. And they're like, hey, my goal is to get better. And so whatever that means, that's what it means. And you'll find these guys that, you know, they'll, they'll have like, I'll take a, a, a really good novice um, guy that I know who's a, I think he's like cat three, cat two right now up in Utah. He's a former climber. So he had like a 20 year base of a ton of aerobic fitness, but not specific to the bike. And, and those are two different types of fitness. One of them was, <clears throat> you know, up, in a, uh, up a mountain, two day assault, you got to pack. That's different than like being on a bike for six hours and sitting on the saddle and doing the same thing over and over again, acyclic, cyclic. And so this guy gets into the gym for the first couple of years and he's like, I'm gonna ride a couple of times a week and I'm gonna be in the gym four times a week. And then all of his races were, in terms of like age group, very poor. And then he said, what I really need to do, and, and in the gym wasn't strength training, it was like CrossFit kind of stuff. Okay. Short, high intense, you know, I'm never gonna spend more than, you know, 20 minutes on a workout, whatever. Um, then the second year he comes back and he has a conversation with the coach and that coach says, well, a recreational, at your level, a recreational cyclist is getting somewhere like 250 hours a year minimum of saddle time. And so he says, okay, well, maybe I need to shift things. So in the gym, I'm only gonna strength train once, twice a week, <laughs> and I'm gonna get more mileage on the bike, and he does way better the second year. Then the third year, he says, I'm gonna try to cycle, and he lives in Utah, so it snows. And he says, I just found this out, I didn't even know this was a thing, but he's like, third year, it was one time of strength training in the gym, and then when the weather was great, I had a lot of easy, slow miles, but then when the weather was really poor, he got a fixed gear, and he set his fixed gear up to ride in the mountain, and he would ride his fixed gear in the winter. So what that ended up becoming was this plan that he developed that um, didn't have a lot of forethought to it except, you know, what's working, what's not, throw it out, whatever. It was like, you know, four to six months of some easy miles and some strength training and prioritizing recovery, and then over the winter it was like a ton of lactic threshold work and a ton of, and you want to get like efficient on a bike and get some strong legs and be able to withstand a really high like cadence you need to ride a fixed gear if you've never ridden a fixed gear before don't ride one on the street like find some open place and get a little finger break but he you know ended up with this plan that uh worked really well for him and then the outcome of that was his best year that he'd ever had and now he's like cat three cat two and um, a full-time cyclist and knows exactly what to do so there are lots of examples of that and uh, you know, he had a different background. The requirement for him for the weather and the climate and then, you know, thinking that, yeah, it's like CrossFit is the answer. I need to do these CrossFit workouts. And it maybe had worked for someone else and didn't work for him. I could take another guy who was completely opposite to that and say, this guy came from a huge strength training background. So power to the pedal. Like, um, I know this guy named Chris Ronan who used to ride with Lance Armstrong. And he's like six foot seven, 260 pounds. And this guy is so strong that he was like, back in the day when they had steel frame bikes, like ripping steel frames in half and breaking crank sets and all this crazy stuff. So what his plan was, was um, he had one day a week where he just maintained some of his strength. And it was like 10 rep max back squat stuff one time a week. That was it, that's all he needed because he's so freaking strong. But the amount of time that this guy had to spend like working up to this base um, was a lot of time. And it was completely opposite from what maybe the guy in Utah was doing because they're completely opposite people and they have different backgrounds. So the takeaway is like, you have these things that need to be covered. How long of time that you spend on all of them, it honestly depends on you and it requires a little bit of the human element of intuition. But what really you're saying is that the old dogma of it has to be this because other people have done it or it has to be this because I need to be contrary just for the sake of being contrarian. It all has to do with, with race report. So my suggestion would be if you're, like if I was gonna start this stuff, I've never done anything on a mountain bike before. It's all been road biking. If I was gonna start, I would say per week, I wanna have one session where I'm learning how to handle the bike. One session per week where I'm working on the power to the bike and that might be in the gym one day a week where I need, I still, for me and my brain, I need to have one day a week where I'm like lifting weights. Yeah. And then I'm gonna have one day a week where I go for a really long ride. And those are my four days a week. 
and the other days are filled with napping and recovery and massage and mobility and all that, and that's what I would start with. And what would change six months from then is to say, maybe in a month, I, I'm, I'm, it was naturally good at handling a bike. And so that stuff can die down a little bit. But I, I realize I have a huge deficit in terms of like being comfortable on the bike for that long. And so that needed to improve. And that ultimately is what periodization is. And you can take all those things and put them down on paper and say, that looks like um, you know, the, the annual training plan of a certain type of athlete, or this is block periodization, whatever. But what, what matters is that like this is the plan and once I've done, I mean, I'd say for me, like I get through six months and I would say, I know enough about myself now that now I can plan out the next couple of months ahead of time. But I'm always keyed into the ability to make changes on the fly. I um, mean, it's kind of what you said in the beginning, like maybe one week I think, God, I'm, I'm really trash for some reason. And what feels good is to knock out one of the threshold sessions and, you know, beat my legs down. And I'm going to go on a second longer ride. And I'm gonna recover really great for a couple of weeks. And then the third week, I'm gonna feel great. And maybe I do more of something else, you know, so there's freedom to do that. Well, and you need to know who you are, I think that's important. <clears throat> when I first started, uh, I had my plan laid out and my plan was very aggressive, but for me, my life factors allowed it to be such. Right. I trained hard, I put in, man, there were weeks where I was 22, 24 hours, right. but I slept eight to 10 hours. Right. I ate incredibly well, I recovered. There's all that, but then, there were times where I had a very aggressive workout plan for that day. Yeah. And if I wasn't motivated to do that workout, I didn't do it. Because for me, I knew myself well enough to know I'm not lazy. If I'm not motivated to go train, something isn't right. And I was okay with that. And I think that's important because I think there's some people out there that maybe some of them are a little lazy, but on the other end of the spectrum, you got people that are so hardcore, I wanna stick to that plan that they might do it to their detriment. Right. So I think these are all important things. Right. And, and the the you know the term like overtraining is kind of a misused term. I don't think there's you you I would be hard pressed to find someone who is like actually overtraining. And I would say there's just there's just a limit for how much time you can spend recovering and so really you're just under recovered. Mm -hmm. Because you know uh, I mean some of the really like high level dudes like that's a, their full time job, you know, and they've got uh, yeah, God, I mean, I, I, I would look at like the best, the best guy in the world who's 100% sponsored, he's not married, doesn't have kids, travels all, you know, that kind of guy, and he's got two or three sessions a day, he's got a, you know, massage in the morning and strength training in the midday and then a ride in the afternoon, six days a week, but he can do that. Well, it's kind of interesting, there's a lot of people like that, but I'll circle it back around to uh, keeping it with the bike. Enduro, the Enduro discipline, the Enduro World Series, I would argue who, whoever wins the Enduro World Series, whoever is that champion, that is the best bike rider in the world, in my opinion, because not only do you have to have an incredible amount of fitness and not only aerobic, but you gotta be prepared to deal with a lot of anaerobic situations, but you have to have enough strength, specific strength, to maneuver through some incredibly tough terrain but also deal with crashes, which are inevitable. Um, and at the same time, uh, you have to be able to handle six, seven, eight hours on the day and incredible amounts of climbing. Right. And for the last few years, Richie Rood has been the winner. And we're talking early 20s, built like a linebacker, just an incredibly gifted athlete and a Red Bull sponsored athlete. So as far as resources go, you can't get any better. Well, this year he didn't win. The guy who won was an absolute living legend named Sam Hill. He's an older athlete, has three kids, so he has a lot of family responsibilities, but he was still able to find a way to do it. And a lot of it was because he had the base. He had a lot of base. And what's great is I just watched the last episode of On Track with Curtis Keene last night, Red Bull TV, incredible show. And it was talking about the season culminating and Sam Hill winning the championship. And He's a very low key guy and they do a lot of you know, first person interviews and he talked about the plan he made, a very specific plan with all the factors involved and how that plan worked. Right. And what he said is, I wanna go have fun and I had an incredible amount of fun, right. but if I didn't have that goal of winning the championship and my roadmap, my plan to get there, it probably wouldn't have happened. Right. It wasn't gonna be by chance. Right. And I think that's, 
it's a pretty damn important thing yeah. to think about. And I, I bet if, if he was to talk about it further, he would say, you know, yeah, I mapped this out, but uh, well, what are all the exceptions to where you had to change? It's a change. I have to change it every week. Oh yeah. I mean, like I had a kid thing, and then I got sick, and then I wrote too much. I wrote too little. But the the thing is that there was like some plan to follow, and the, the you know, on one side, no plan is planning to fail. On the other side, there's paralysis by analysis, which is. I plan myself out of success because I'm I'm almost setting myself up for this like really unrealistic situation that I think I mean, I've done this before with yeah, a ton of clients myself, which is like this is the training plan, and I, I I speculate this is exactly what I need, and then I write it and I look at it and think there's no way I'm going to be able to, to I'm never going to win this thing because what I just wrote is impossible for me, and it was because. God, and I had no idea, I'd never experienced that before. So there's this good middle ground, which is to say, if you know what you need, if you know yourself, and if you know some of the basic tenets of strength and conditioning, like, um, you know, we could make a list of, here's the, you know, top five, you know, this is like a men's journal article, the top five in gym strength training movements for enduro riders, and, oh, yeah. you know, how to, how how to craft articles. your, uh, you know, how to craft your lactate threshold ride. Train like Richie Rude. Exactly. Um, I mean, we could do that, but like to have at least some format of, of how to plan that out. And then there's freedom to do it, like freedom to change. And that's all based on you. And I think if, if someone was going to start, if they had no idea, they'd never done it before, the inappropriate way would be to say, I'm going to follow exactly what Sam did because he won. And if he's the best rider, yes. doesn't it make sense that I need to have those kind of rides too? Yeah. And uh, anybody who follows this, you know, those like secret squirrel, like somebody knew his coach who forwarded me this, who forwarded me that, and I got his training plan, let's do it. I, 100% of the time, know that people get injured doing that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. No one will ever get through that successfully. Well, we can give them the secret. I mean, do you want, if you want to give them the secret. I don't know, man. Okay, we'll break it. We'll give you the secret. And this is, we've talked to a lot of high-level strength coaches. There's an acronym for success, plain and simple. It's called KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. That's literally what it comes down to. That's all it is. So many people, they think it's all <laughs> complex, it's all these different things, and yeah. at the end of the day, I, I, don't, I don't think it is. It's simple. It's not, it, it's, it is not complicated, and you know, part, part of like the conversation here is, we're talking about all this stuff because we already know it, but people need to do the research on it, is like, you know, you can, like we could write a training plan that uh, everyone who's, you know, let's say the people that attend your clinic, they're a certain caliber of rider, and like we could write a plan for them, a general plan to follow, and it would that would not it'd take me ten minutes to do that. Uh, but the best coaches in the world don't really do that. Um, like there's a uh, Dan John would say, we talked about him I think last week, yeah. but like Dan John is like you know. What are the secrets for getting strong and, and looking really good? And and if you see some of the guys he works with, you're like, I need to get my coffee ready because I'm about to get into an hour you know lecture here. And he'll say, Oh, uh, you need to eat more protein. <laughs> you need to take Metamucil. You need to sleep more, and you need to lift weights. And if you can do that for a year <laughs> and nothing else, it, it, tell me that that won't work. Yeah. There's a guy who uh, passed away a few years ago who ran this. Uh, it's where Cadell Evans trained in uh, Italy, and he's this Italian cycling coach, and he said that every single rider that comes in gets the same algorithm of like a, uh, a hill repeat day, and then a, a threshold ride day, and then a really long day. And he's like, they do these three days in a row, and then they rest, and they basically repeat that. And he would say, I know, as 20 years of coaching, I know enough that this guy is gonna need this mo much more of this one thing. But the answer wasn't like this complicated computer algorithm written program. It was, uh, yeah, that's, you need to have these three rides and you need to do them a lot and uh, that's it. You know, they're really, really simple answers. But everybody's looking for that like secret squirrel, you know, top secret hidden program and there isn't one. And that's the frustrating thing about planning and training is that, man, the first five minutes of every conversation we have with a new athlete is always like, so I'm th they'll say to me, so I'm thinking about you know this, 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 and I'm like, yeah, maybe, but maybe not, and I have no idea, and there's a million more ways to do it, and uh, how do we figure that out? You're going to have to actually like experience some of this stuff first. 
And once you experience it, I can make my most informed you know, assumption about what would work. But it's this constant test, retest, test, retest. And, you know, I would say like, even if you don't plan something out, the first place to start for everyone who's listening, if you don't have a plan, is, this is what I wanted. To is you need to sit down and you need to write out all of the things that are required for the race, or or the the thing that you're trying to accomplish in terms of writing. These are the six things that I think I need to have, and then you write a list that says these are the things that I think or I know I'm very good at. And then the third list is, these are the things that I'm really lacking in. And those lists are ordered like this. On one side of the paper, there's all the things that I need. And then I stack those good and bad lists of the bad stuff first and the good stuff second. So I have maybe eight entries. And the entry is like my aerobic base, my leg strength, my technique, and then underneath it's you know, the stuff that I'm good at, uh, you know, I'm really good at recovering. I can tolerate a ton of time in the saddle, yada, yada, yada. And when you plan those out, the first things that always go into your plan are those things that you're bad at. How you accomplish yeah. those things, there's a million and one ways to do it. And, you know, if you do the math there, it's like eight things multiplied by all the options for those things multiplied by how many times I can do them. And that's literally millions of combinations. But that's where you start. And then when you create the plan, you're like, okay, what's the, what's the day of the week that I'm most assured that I will never miss that day? And that's the day that the stuff that you're not very good at needs to go on. Um, we like Mondays here because most people show up fresh from the weekend, but it could be Saturday. Like I know guaranteed Saturday is the day that I have a lot of time to spend doing X, Y, or Z. And the first thing on my list is, I'm an enduro rider, but I weigh 120 pounds and I can't squat uh, below parallel with an empty barbell. My legs need to get stronger. Unlike Mr. Gross, who just turned in, or tuned in, who's an absolute powerhouse of an athlete, and he might be the next rider and has massive legs to squat yeah, at 400 and, pounds. And he might be the opposite. And, and, and then <laughs> to determine, you know, honestly, if you want to get really nitty into it, it's like, okay, these good and these bad things, how do I know how good or how bad at them that I am? Then I need to actually have some test. Yeah. So you could come up with a test for everyone. And the t I could, let's uh, off the top of our head, come up with some. If I wanted to know how aerobic I was on a bike, um, get a heart rate monitor. Don't mess with power because you spend a thousand dollars and if you don't really know how power works, it'll yeah. just make you more a lot frustrated. Of data to extrapolate. But you get a heart rate monitor, take 180 and subtract your age. If you're injured, you subtract five more points, and that number is on the heart rate monitor, the highest that you're able to creep. And then you go ride some flat, looped course that doesn't have a lot of undulating terrain, but like maybe you get on the freaking K trail or something, yeah. or White Rock. Do a lap around White Rock, and don't let your heart rate go above that. And then see how much distance you can cover, or, or how fast you're going, or how long it takes you to take a lap around White Rock at 130 beats per minute, and you say, well, today it took me two hours. And that's my test for aerobic fitness. And then I think I was like 12 miles an hour. I couldn't go any faster, because any faster than 12 miles an hour, and my heart rate was exploding. So then you postulate, okay, that sounds to me like that should have been a lot faster than that. But I couldn't, to be aerobic, couldn't go any faster. So then they say, well, maybe I should do some more long, slow miles. And then in two weeks, come back and test that at that same heart rate and see if it didn't take you 15 minutes less to go down the way. And you say, aha, that makes sense to me. My aerobic base I thought was poor. I measured it. I trained it for two weeks. I retested it, and it improved. Therefore, that might be something I need to spend attention on. For the strength training thing, we have this uh, thing called an Airdyne in here, an assault bike. Um, it's a, a wind-resisted fixed gear pedal slash arm pedal bike. It's horrible. Go one minute all out as hard as you can, and you get your calories for it. I'll tell you that on an, on an Airdyne, 60 calories in a minute is pretty good. If you get less than 60, that's pretty bad. If you get more than 60, that's good. You get 40, and you say, it sounds to me like... I need to get more power to the pedal or I need to have this lactate thing. So you go ride and you do those couple of extra sessions and in a month you do the minute again and you're like, man, I got 10 calories extra. I guess that means that that was something that I needed. <laughs> and so you have these tests for each thing or some benchmark and it could be like, man, um, we've used Strava before that like, okay, you know, 
go ride this, go ride the South Loop and uh, as fast as you can. Like time trial as fast as you can and then let's see where you rank on Strava compared to riders that are similar to you and then let's have a conversation about what was the hardest about that race. I wasn't sucking wind, my legs were trashed. I wasn't sucking wind, like my feet got numb and my taint hurt, you know? And yeah. like, then we take that and we say, that's the stuff that we need to work on because that was the thing that slowed you so, down. So let me, let me dive a little deeper into that because take the South Ride, for example, that's a great one because when I do that, it gets to where my legs hurt really bad. That, that gets to be, that lactic buildup gets to be a limiting factor. But I have a really good friend that he comes back to his legs are fine. It's more his ability to breathe. Who? It's the oxygen. <laughs> his name is Troy. Okay. And now Troy, Troy's 42, 43. He's got a really good base underneath him. Um, and he actually has a decent strength background. Um, he trained at Metroflex. I mean, he had a big deadlift back Ronnie the Coleman. Yeah, he actually trained with Ronnie. Wow. Well, lightweight. So now the pendulum has swung back and I've been trying to get him to do a little bit more strength work with me. Now he does strength work, but I mean, he's on a leg press machine. Right. Try and tell him, dude, you don't, there's so many better things you would do before you got on a leg press machine. Yeah. So in his situation, do you think he would, he would gain an advantage or he would improve by skewing a little bit more on what, the strength side or the aerobic side? I mean, yeah. if, if, I get what you're saying. Um, so it goes back to that thing I mentioned earlier, which is making, making muscular endurance or making strength work and that's what Clinton asked Clinton asked a while ago can you uh, dive a little deeper on that so um, there's two opposite ends of that spectrum and one is that you purposely do something that is aerobic so the heart rate monitor thing figure out what your aerobic threshold is which is a really low beat per minute measurement and you go ride and you say, I'm not gonna go up. That's like zone one for old heart rate monitor data. Um, so that is 100% aerobic, which means I might like, for real, like some people are saying, man, I average you know, 18 to 22 mile per hour. And you just had me do that and I was averaging 14. I'm like, yeah, because that's how slow you have to go to keep it 100% aerobic. <clears throat> when you do, uh, anything that is muscular endurance or has strength work, let's take an example of like charging up a hill. Like the difference between someone who can make a muscular endurance contraction aerobic and someone that muscular endurance becomes lactic acid, a lot of it has to do with just the approach to training. So to make, uh, like as that example, I go, I charge as hard as I can and it, it is at an effort that if I said I need to do that exact same hill again in five minutes, and I have to have the same time up that hill, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever. If I can't repeat that same time, so it's 30 seconds for the first hill, I rest five minutes, and then it's like a minute 15. It means that that contraction was not aerobic, because aerobic by definition is sustainable and repeatable. So a lot of that is the, the uh, people being misinformed about how to approach interval stuff. Um, that's where I mentioned like being really sub threshold that you know what what is a long slow ride it's like we're just chatting for three hours it couldn't be any easier than this but then people go the opposite total end extreme of but when I do hill work I better be barfing on my jersey and falling off my bike by the end and it, it's actually not it needs to be very sub threshold it's pretty difficult but it needs to be something that's repeatable because if you do something that becomes lactic acid and isn't aerobic, the fact that you can't repeat it means that you're teaching yourself what failure is because you, you failed to complete a successful second rep. And that rep was doing the same thing at 30 seconds, but you failed to do that. So all you're experiencing is what it feels like to be fatigued, to operate in a fatigued state not operate in a state of recovery or uh, a manageable effort and then <clears throat> I'm only experiencing this training under a deficit but where we where we get messed up is that feels very rewarding hard work <laughs> feels very rewarding and the feeling that I have in my legs from going slower or doing worse there's endorphins in the brain there's a dopamine effect and I think oh man that must have been really good for me because I'm trashed uh, but to make a muscular endurance contraction aerobic, meaning 
that hill sprint might have been really hard, but in five minutes, I'm completely recovered enough where I could keep repeating that thing over and over again. How, how that gets trained is, for example, you would have to, let's take the hill and continue with that. So I, I say, I wanna get through five repetitions. I'm gonna jam up the hill, and then I'm gonna easy pedal recover for five minutes, and I'm gonna do it five times. And I'm gonna go up the hill at a pace that I'm guaranteed to repeat that. And maybe the first session feels a little too easy. Like, I could have probably gone a lot harder than that. That's good. Because that, you know, let's say that was 45 seconds per rep, and it was all 45 seconds. The second time that I do it, what am I trying to do, accomplish? I need to knock off two to five seconds. And then if I do one of those hill rides every week, in six weeks from now, I went from 45 seconds to 30 seconds, but I can repeat it five times. And this is where the money's made. If I can do that thing to that amount of volume, repeat it five times, what would happen if I only had to do it one time? How hard could I actually go? So you're teaching yourself how to make these lactate you know, limited uh, movements, intervals, schemes, whatever, teaching them how to be aerobic because they were repeatable. And I'm gonna argue that all training, all training, whether it's easy or hard, or how difficult it feels at the end, needs to be repeatable. There are only certain situations where it shouldn't be repeatable, and the only time it's not, or the only time it is repeatable, is if there's an insane amount of rest in between it. So if I do uh, like that minute air, if, have you done a minute air dime before? So if you ever do a minute air dime, I will do that soon and I'll report <laughs> back with that. Maybe we'll do it live. You do a minute on the watt bike and you get 60 calories and someone says, rest five minutes, do it again. And you get 70 calories, your workout's done. I mean, uh, uh, 50 calories, so you got 10 less. 60 the first, rest five minutes, 50 the second. Your workout's done, you weren't able to repeat it. That meant that it wasn't aerobic because if the, the mechanism, there's too much lactic acid accumulated in your lactate shuttle mechanism like doesn't flush it enough so you're starting the second at a deficit so deficit is an important word deficit fatigue not recovery fresh not ability and capacity but at a deficit if i wanted to go through that successfully i would have to say you either are going to need 15 or 20 minutes worth of rest to be able to repeat that thing and that much rest indicates to us that's pretty like lactic heavy. That's not very aerobic. Uh, doesn't mean that it's not that, that it doesn't have to be hard though, because if you are that hard of a worker, and I'll explain this in a second. But let's say you get 60 for the first set, and you rest five minutes, and you get 59. I'm gonna say, okay, you, you know, that's that's good. brain fart, whatever, but that's good, and that might mean that it puts you into the dirt, and then that's just an issue of, well, how can you recover from this stuff? It's sustainable. You're repeating it over and over again. It's like repetitions. So, repet it, you know, the 10,000 hour rule, that Malcolm Gladwell thing, yeah, you gotta get 10,000 hours, you gotta get 10,000 reps, but it has to be quality, and quality means for guys like you, yeah. sustainable and repeatable. So this is, this is good, and, and Clinton, you just touched on it. Uh, Chris, same way. We're gonna go deeper into this. What he just touched on is gonna be a future session that focuses I would say more on the enduro aspect of things because what you just talked about, that's 60 second on the air dime for however many calories, that's for all intents and purposes an enduro stage. And that's what so many of us have issues with. And we're gonna get to there because we're gonna talk about um, what Sam and I uncovered to try and deal with issues I was having. When you have a longer enduro stage, I think it's easier. Most people think, oh, the shorter the better. I would disagree because what that means is you instantly, right out of the hole, have to be wide open. And for me, that's an issue. I need to be able to ramp up to get to where right. my output is such that I can maintain it repeated for five, six, right. seven stages. I can't go out and give 100% in, in a first stage. I'm done after that. Right. And I've told this to a lot of people. It's If you can give 100%, 100% of the time, wow, I big high five to you. I can't do that. Um, in an enduro race, in any stage, any given stage, if I creep up over 92%, I'm done. Bad things are going to happen. I may go faster, but there's a much higher percentage of me crashing. And so many people say, well, wait a minute, 92%? How can you know what 92% is? And I can tell you, I know what 92% is because of this guy right here. For years, we were programmed to have our, our output, our efforts at anywhere from 80 to 85, 88 to 
And I think you can get to where yeah. you have a good idea of what that is. And I mean, we're going to wrap this up because we're, we're getting very deep and this has been a lot for people to absorb. But my best advice to you, there's a couple pieces of it. The first is, if you know anybody, and I don't know if there's many people out there like this guy, but um, if you know somebody that has information like he does, surround yourself with them. I don't have many original thoughts when it comes to training. What I do is I yield to what he says, what the other coaches here at CrossFit Dallas Central say, because I know they're experts and they've done the research. So what I try to do is get as much from them to try and lay out my plan. I think that's really important. Don't fancy yourself an expert unless you have all these years, unless you've done your due diligence. Do some research, but at the same time, then step back and say, okay, how would this apply to me? And maybe ask somebody who's an expert. So I think I want to wrap this up. We've been on here a very, very long time, uh, but I think it's been good. And what we've highlighted is some topics for uh, future discussions. So next Tuesday, we're going to have Dean Zhu back on to talk about how his endurance race was, what his training was more specifically leading up to it, and how he felt uh, that training application worked, maybe some areas where it didn't work. Would he change things? Would he do it exactly the same? Then, what I've just decided, the next Tuesday, Sam's gonna be back, and we're not gonna sit here. We're actually gonna go over here on the middle of the gym floor, and I am gonna do a 60 second air dime test and possibly puke right in front of you. You should, so, and we'll talk about it. We'll, we'll treat it like it's a normal assessment, and be a good thing for you guys to hear because Man, I'm, as you're talking, I'm getting a lot of like, you know, really good thoughts and, and, I, I, and I, I don't think that it is about, it's not about effort, right? It's like race day effort, no one has a problem with that. It's about the, like how to be really informed about what training actually means and what it's really doing to you. So we're gonna, I would like to go through the 60 second airdyne test and you have to repeat it a couple of times. So he's gonna go through it and you guys will see what's up and then um, we'll, interpret some of the information and talk about like what implications that might have for Richard and, and what he's training for and then how can you guys take some of those nuggets away and say ah aha uh, you know if my race is one minute of booking it and then five or ten minutes of fighting and strategy uh, and I'm getting worse as the race goes on how can I impact that and affect that in the training and you have to know how this stuff works. You gotta know what the effect is on the body. And so, I mean, I would love to do that. Yeah, and what we'll also do in between those brutal sessions is we'll talk about some ways, some, some small programs that you can do, uh, or workouts more, I guess, in particular, to, to work on this. I was having problems with this, and uh, I approached Sam's brother, Spencer, and I said, hey man, look, here's my issue. This is what I'm trying to do. I laid out what an enduro race was like and what I was experiencing. And he listened very intently, and then he laid out uh, a couple specific workouts. And I did those, and in a matter of three weeks, I went from thoroughly struggling to the next race I went to, I crushed it. I absolutely crushed it, and I was shocked. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was shocked. It was brutal. I mean, I have video of what he had me do. Um, I did unweighted barbell jump squats to tuck jumps to 90 second row all out and it was absolutely vile and horrible but holy crap the amount of progression I could see not even week to week but just workout to workout was was staggering and it was funny because I had my wife in there trying to give me some motivation because it was really hard to do it by myself and she even noticed it. she said wow this is crazy not only are you you're going faster, it's happening quicker, but your movements are so much better, and it just, I was really impressed with how it worked out, so we'll talk about some of that stuff, right? So in the meantime, if you have any questions, um, if you need some help, if you wanna discuss a topic that we've touched on, or maybe that we haven't, um, then feel free to email me. It's sammynix at gmail.com. Um, it's my personal email, so I check it as often as I can and uh, ladies be sure to email oh my god I mean he's a bachelor so thank you again for tuning in I, I hope everybody liked it we got some great comments uh, if you have questions please write the questions out what we can do is we can take a few minutes next week uh, and the week after to answer those questions and in the meantime send questions on the athlete Facebook page or you can even do it uh, on the Instagram any of that stuff because 
if we have more questions, those are things that we can not only answer, but structure topics around them. Absolutely. So, okay. sweet. Pounds. Thanks. Thanks for tuning Blowing in. Up. Have a great day, everybody. Sit there awkwardly. <laughs> huh?